The Seagulls have raised £320 million in player sales in the last 12 months. Have a think about that. Mm. £320 million alone with around 244 of that, they reckon, profit. So how much are these Brighton players worth, Andy? Matoma signed for £2.7 million. Ferguson, like, 600 grand. That's the opinion. £15.4 million. Valuation's just about right, or...? Well, uh, the, time the, will tell. Uh, time, w- time will tell on that. What I what I love about what they do is that when someone goes and and, and there's somebody off, there, there's somebody there that comes in and they are able to come in and pick it up pretty darn quickly, and which is what you need. Whenever you move players on you, and you have to replace them, your fingers crossed, of course. And I'm sure at Brighton they do a lot of that. They hope. Well, but 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 they try to eliminate a lot of that hope by doing tons of homework and tons of research and I'm fascinated with all these algorithms and, and all of this stuff well there's Evan Ferguson for example signed for 600 yeah, grand yeah. how much is he worth now? oh he's worth a, a, a <laughs> ton more than that <laughs> you know he certainly is well I'm delighted to say that man who can tell is definitely if you've got a future as a Premier League CEO because Brighton Hove Albion Chief Executive Paul Barber is joining us on the show very at this very moment Paul a very good morning good Chief morning, thank Paul. you very very much for taking the time to join us um, what a job I mean I, I keep saying it Paul it's a, the club just seems to be run absolutely brilliantly oh morning Ali morning Andy thanks morning. very much we're, we're enjoying um, we're enjoying this period um, obviously last season was a fantastic um, campaign for the club finishing in our highest position and qualifying for Europe and there's a lot of people behind the scenes that are working very hard to make all of that happen not least the players on the pitch and the coaches so You know, we've just got to keep it going now. You know, the hard thing is to sustain, you know, the success that we've had, relatively speaking, and and keep moving forward. Paul, is is there an acceptance, mate? Because um, Andy and I have been speaking about yesterday and this morning. It's brilliant that I've had a couple of... I went down to two or three games down in Britain. It's just a brilliant place to go. You know, they look after you really well. There's just a smashing environment and feeling about, the feel-good factor about the place. Is there an acceptance, do you think, Paul, from the supporters... Um, clearly they will be absolutely delighted at what they're seeing and the way the club has been run and the way the club is moving. But do you get one or two mumps and moans about maybe wanting to hold on to players a little bit longer? Or generally speaking, can they see what's happening and, and, and see, you know, obviously everything that's good about it? I think supporters will always moan. About one yeah, or two. Yeah. That's, that's the nature of the beast. But I think overall... Um, you know, the fans are really delighted with the progress of the club and, and you know, how things have gone. I mean, we're very fortunate to have a an owner and a chairman like Tony Bloom, who had a very clear vision uh, 12 years ago to, to sort of put the club in the position it's in now. It's taken, you know, a lot of hard work, as I said, from a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But we're now beginning to see the fruits of the investment in our academy, uh, the investment in our recruitment processes, and obviously the progress we've made under successive coaches. And, you know, the football that we've been playing under Roberto and before that, Graham, and, and let's not forget, forget the work that Chris Hutton did before that, yeah. uh, you know, has been building to where we are now. And we're also, you know, not perfect. We, you know, we make mistakes. We'll get things wrong. You know, recruitment isn't a perfect pro- process in any business, let alone football. Um, so we know that there'll be bumps in the road. You know, success doesn't come in any kind of straight line that, you know, there's going to be moments where we're going to be tested and our resilience will be tested. Um, but we hope over the years of experience that we've built up, um, we'll be able to sort of withstand those bumps and the resilience will kick in and help us through. Mm. Paul, we've seen Newcastle recently over the last um, last 18 months, you know, new owners and, and and a successful campaign last time around playing Champions League football. You guys, you do, what you do, you do it quite uniquely and you do it brilliantly. And and I think we're all, we're, we all agree with that. However, what we must also say now that... Brighton have to start now attacking those top five spots. How far how, how how far away from that are you realistically from being in a position you think to to you're getting it right off the field, you're getting it right on the field to you know largely. But how how soon do we think we can expect Brighton to be really pushing at the very top end? Huh. Well, I mean, we pushed as hard as we could last season, and I think we ended up nine points off of a of a Champions League place. But we we we're, we're realistic, Andy. We know we don't have the the budgets that that the mm-hmm. big six or seven, as it is now, clubs have. We we know that we have to compete in a different way. We have to fish in different ponds, as we say. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, part of our model is to try and find the players that others are either not looking for or can't see. And um, from that point of view, if we can do that. 
and then our coaches can develop them and our, our recruitment staff can get the deals over the line, um, then we've got a chance because we can bring in good players, we can develop them, we can accelerate their development through a good loan program where we've got good people working on the player pathway. And then we get to a stage like Moises where, you know, clubs with 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 bigger wealth than us will come along and, and, and buy them. And then we've got to do it all over again. And, and so the process has to repeat. And that's the biggest challenge. You know, as you go further up the table, obviously to improve your squad becomes that much harder because by definition, you've got a good squad mm-hmm. to start with and, and then improving it is a is a smaller group of players than, than perhaps it was three years ago. But we know that, we understand that. And, um, you know, we're very aware of, of the need to, to keep doing what we're doing. But as I said before, it's not a perfect science. There will be moments when... You know, we get things wrong and, um, you know, it, it is the nature of football that not every recruitment into a squad works out. Paul, you, you touched on it and obviously the, the, the job and the transformation in the club, um, yourself and, 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 and Tony Bloom since he's come to the club. Tell me, does, what, what would you say is, is Tony's expertise um, and is one of his strengths... You know, appointing does he let does he let his staff get on with it? Obviously, he rules the roost and sees everything that's going on. What what would you say his main strengths are? I think his main strength really is is having a very clear vision for where he wanted the club to get to and how he wanted the club to get there. And then what he does is he appoints people to to deliver that vision. He doesn't get involved in the day to day. He's he's not involved in the direct negotiations with other clubs on the sale of players or the purchase of players. That's not what he does. He leaves that to us to get on with. Um, but he's he's got a very, very sort of um, nice way about letting the club operate in the way that I think football clubs should. You know, the chairman is the chairman. He sets the vision. He decides on how he wants the club to run. He then appoints people that um, hopefully know what they're doing to get on with that. Um, and then he intervenes when he's asked to intervene. And when he, you know, he, he we need his help or we need his guidance, he's always there to provide it. But day to day, he lets us get on with it. And mm. I think that's uh, that's a good model. It doesn't every club's different every club works in a slightly different way but for us that works very well and um you know we're very lucky to have him the investment he's made in the club the belief that he's had in the club and the love that he has for the club i think all those things combined give us the best possible chance of success but as i said there's no guarantees you know we have to we have to still work at it paul how surprised were you when when moises caicedo and obviously his, his his team around him when they decided not to go to Liverpool, when you got that offer of of where we're, 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 we're informed that it was around under an eleven million pounds, whatever it was, and then you heard that he's not going there, you must have been surprised at that, taken aback by that, and 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 why why do you not why do you think he didn't want to go there? Um, well, I mean, first of all, Liverpool's a fantastic football club, and and um, you know. If- for any footballer to have the chance to play at Liverpool, at Anfield, you know, you would imagine that they they would be running up the uh, the M6 and M62, but um, it wasn't to be. Um, Moises and his advisors decided for, for whatever reason that London was their preferred uh, destination for a move and, and, and ultimately Chelsea. Um, and obviously in that situation, we're in a in a slightly difficult position because we've negotiated a deal. We've spent many days um, working with Liverpool to to get a deal agreed, and they they couldn't have done any more. They they were superb, professional throughout, no doubt about that whatsoever. Um, but then you know it comes down to the player, and at that point we're very much out of the, out of the loop because it's a discussion between the player and the, and and Liverpool and and then the agent, and then ultimately they come to a decision. Mm. At the point that um, that it was clear that he wasn't going to Liverpool, then we have to go into a different mode because you know having negotiated you know a British record transfer, we, we we've then got to do it again three mm. days later, um, which is unusual to say the least. Um, and and we did, and and you know we 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 started working with Chelsea as soon as we realised that Liverpool were not able to proceed. Then obviously at that point we've got to protect our own interests, and our interests are our player, and making sure that we realise the value for that player that that we were expecting. Uh, and we've done that, um, and you know Moises now goes on to the next stage of his career. He's a fine player. He could become you know one of the best midfield players in the world. He's got that much potential. So. Um, we've done our bit in in the in the in the pro, pro, progress of his career. You know, he's now on to the next stage. We're on to the next stage because we've got a great squad. We've got players coming through behind him, which is our model. Um, and we'll look to move on from from here. Paul, just trying to get my head around the the, the, the process. Um, and, and believe me, I'm not trying to sell the rest of your squad as well. But say, for example, Evan Ferguson, who we mentioned, there's come in, is doing really, really well. 
say he continues to progress and creates a, a little bit of interest, which he, you know he's, he's certainly one you'd, you'd, you'd look to the future. At what time, if somebody comes in and makes an offer, at what time do you all sit round the table? Does that is it a footballing decision initially, or does it immediately become a business decision? Well, in Evan's case, at least five years' time, Ali. Yeah, um, it's done. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, of course, it, it, it ultimately the, the the technical staff are, are are making the key decisions on you know where a player is at that in his development, you know whether whether he needs you know more first team games or whether he needs to go out on loan or whether we should be um, you know looking to, to to trade earlier or or later. You know, it's ultimately it's going to be a collective decision, but certainly it's driven by the technical staff. And, and we're relying on them to to make those judgments in terms of the player's development. You know, there are times when it's better for us to keep a player in and around our first team group and training with us and getting the odd appearance from the bench or, or in cup games. And other times it's better for them to go out on loan to Europe. And other times it's better for them to stay in this country and be on loan where we can actually keep a, a far closer eye on them. But those decisions, you know, Tony and I leave to the technical staff and we only really get involved when it comes to you know the financial decisions and and where we go next. But uh, it's a combined effort. It's a team effort. It's as much as the team off the pitch as it is on it. And I, you know, Tony and I both strongly believe in that that we we have to work collaboratively and collectively. And ultimately, of course, Roberto De Zerbi is is making the big calls when yeah. it comes to the playing squad. Paul, well, listen, really, lovely to talk yeah, to you. Yeah, great. Really yeah. enjoyed that. Thanks very much for taking the time to join us here on Talk Sport Breakfast, Paul, and continued success to you. Great story. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you very much. Talk Sport Breakfast, waking you up Monday to Friday morning from 6 a.m. on AM, on DAB, via the Talk Sport app, and on your smart speaker. Talk Sport.